All right. Okay, welcome everybody to another Thrive in EDU show on the Learning Revolution. Uh, before we get started with today's guest and today's topic, I wanted to let everybody know that there are a lot of different events happening coming up that you can check out on the learningrevolution.com site. You can find out who my guests will be on the Thrive in EDU show page. Make some suggestions, would love to have you. And of course, the recordings are also always available on the site and on YouTube. And so for today, I'm excited to have a couple of authors here to talk about the stories, the power of stories, writing, books, you name it, anything that we decide to cover in this time that we spend together. So I'm Rochelle Danae Poth. I'm excited to have three of my good friends here today to talk about the books that they have written and share the stories. So introducing them individually, and then I'll have them introduce themselves. I have joining me, Melanie McAllister, Jeff Kubiak, and Dr. Joy. And they have each written uh, a book which they can show and share. And so I will first turn it over to Melody to introduce herself and uh, let us know where she's joining from and a little bit about her. Hey everybody, it is so good to be here. Thank you, Rochelle, for letting me be here. And it's so good to be connected with friends who I love. Um, my name is Melody McAllister. I am hailing in from Anchorage, right outside of Anchorage actually. And um, you know, I am, um, I'm teaching my kids. I got five kids, four of them are in school. So I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing author visits. I'm also part of the EduMatch team as the logistics manager. And I do some consulting on the side with other educators. Um, and so I'm just here, I love this, thank you. And I wrote the I'm sorry story when I was teaching fifth grade, when I was pregnant with my oldest and she's about to be 12. So it was a long time ago, but I of course have revised it and revised it. And right now I'm getting, um, actually this week I'll have my first Alaskan teacher virtual visit. So I'm so excited to talk about my story. Thank you for having me on. Yay, that's awesome. And I, I knew when you started writing that, but I always forget about it. So thank you for your introduction and for being here today. And next I will go to Jeff Kubiak. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Mel, because I don't have a book handy. So um, my name is Jeff. I am uh, tuning in from Davis, California, about midway between Sacramento and San Francisco. And I wrote a book last year called One Drop of Kindness, the little journey of uh, our friend named Gus. And um, my next book will be out uh, at the end of October and it is called It's Me. And I'm very excited about that project too. Um, both books are fictional, nonfiction stories uh, that I've taken from my teaching, my education days from teachers, students, and things like that. So I like to bring messages to uh, reality. And thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. And thank you, Melody, for holding up the book. Need to see it, get the visual. All right. And finally, Dr. Joy. Hey, good to be here again. It's always nice to talk to you. I have my own book today, Melody. <laughs> but thank you for up, always you never hold it up very long. Thank you for, I know she always complains I don't hold it up long enough, but thank you for always having my back. Um, I'm here in Virginia Beach, where um, I, I'm also at home with my kids right now, um, transitioning to homeschooling with them um, for, the, for the time being. I'm working on multiple projects right now. I completed Back to Zero this year. That's my first children's book. Um, and I'm hoping that this becomes a series of books focused on helping um, students, kids, and even adults go through um, navigate challenges. I also work in higher education um, in the area of curricula and instruction, and currently supporting um, different organizations doing work with this book focused, focused on helping um, students navigate big emotions during um, difficult times. So once again, very happy to be here. Always nice to be able to chat with you. Yeah, well, thank you for taking the time and uh, I'm excited for our conversation today. Don't really know totally what questions I will ask you, but I will say, we'll see where the conversation takes us. And if anybody who joins in or even after, if you're watching this, you have questions for the guests, for myself, don't hesitate to reach out and connect with us. I'll make sure you have all of the information in the description with today's episode. So first, I think the most important question that I think I, I want to ask and start with is what made you or what led you to write your story or how was it difficult to get started? But really primarily, you know, a lot of us, when we think about writing for myself, I never thought I would write a book, let alone a couple of books or even a blog was so challenging to me. I'm like, what would I write about? 
but for each of you, your books are so unique for so many reasons. And so I'm not going to call on you one by one, but if anybody wants to, you know, just talk and share, you know, what led you to feel like, yeah, I want to write this book. And this is what I want to write this book about. Well, I'll start. So you don't hear the crickets in my, in my yard, <laughs> but, um, I really, this wasn't a book that I was initially working on. I was um, really focused on my Joy Work, Joy Work book that is coming out. But this book was actually personal because um, my son was having a hard time navigating school. And I wrote something for him, just how to kind of de-escalate when he's having a hard time. And then it became a book. So um, I always feel like sometimes the best projects are things that just come from the heart. And this was definitely hard work for me. It was, I was trying to help my son um, navigate school. So that's where this came from. That is awesome. Thank you. Um, Go ahead, Jeff. I, oh, thank you. I, I, uh, after, you know, being around a lot of different schools and students, um, you, you could really see the schools that had kind of the SEL components embedded and um, I think when that is lacking, you can really tell as well. And schools that, you know, really flow seamlessly and, and a lot has to do with the leadership of the culture, you know, and when, when kindness is missing, um, there's, you know, there's kind of a icky air about the school and um, you can really feel the difference. And so I, I took the story of Gus. Um, Gus was kind of me, uh, a kid that was broken. But he's also, you know, he's really a metaphor for any student um, that hasn't really been connected to or um, given a fair chance. And, you know, Gus happens to be a foster child. And so he went, you know, school to school, home to home. We have so many foster kids, right? Um, and he struggled until one day it kind of, you know, everything rang true, a message from his mom that he really does have kindness in his heart. And he started to spread that. And, you know, I, I just see schools that have these kindness clubs and, and intentional uh, messages and lessons embedded from the very early years. And as they grow, they really do build, I think, more empathic, compassionate, global citizens. And I think that's something that our nation is really missing. And the same thing with my next book, It's Me. Um, you know, I took, I took vignettes of real people that are stories of groups or individuals that are in, I, I would say, less empowered situations, you know? So there's, um, you know, a black male educator, there's an LGBTQ girl, there's a boy in a wheelchair, there's a girl with Tourette's, all these different things that, um, you know, that are really kind of prejudged and not given a fair shake. And, so trying to uh, spread those messages that are really important to me. I, I, I kind of use that as my passion mission to just spread the message. Yeah, I definitely see that. Yeah, and Melody? Yeah, and I just want to say that I'm big fans of both of these books, and um, I really cannot wait for It's Me to come out. Um, and I think that's something that we all have in common is um, just, you know, we're educators, and um, we have been able to look at adversity in our lives. I grew up in a really, uh, you know, I, I, I don't usually talk about it because, you know, people in my life and my family are still alive and I never want to hurt them, but I'm going to be honest. I grew up in a very toxic environment. Um, you know, there was a lot of ugliness that was said to me and my siblings, and we were awful to each other because we were just doing what we were taught. And, um, you know, the, the time I was never apologized to for all of this stuff. And I, even as an adult, I, 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 you know, it's just hard. And so I thought when I teach and when I left home, I left home as soon as I could. And I, and I moved to a different state as soon as I could. And um, I thought one thing I want my students to know, and then eventually my own children is that number one, everybody deserves an apology. We are imperfect people and we do things that hurt people, but we can at least own up to that. I respect people who say, you know, um, I shouldn't have done this. You know, I did this. And even if like you're going back and forth, you know, and well, you made me do this because you said this. No, 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 no. Saying I'm sorry is literally taking ownership for your actions. And you guys know this is lost on many adults. So trying to teach young people this is, 
Um, it, it's just, it's something very important to me. And I, and I talk about this all the time when people ask, but like when you're doing this amazing lesson and then your students come in from lunch or specials and they had some sort of fight in, um, in one of those areas and they come back into your class and you can't get through a lesson because your kids, your students, they only care about what she said to her or what he said to him. And it just becomes, it just comes back into your class. It's messy because life is messy. Relationships are messy. And just trying to teach kids um, how to take ownership for the things that they did to one another um, was why I wrote this, the I'm sorry story, because um, it's easier to tell a story than it is to lecture. And um, I didn't want to lecture my kids. And the first time when I wrote this, I'm sorry if I sound um, kind of choppy about all of this. The first time I wrote this and shared it with my fifth graders, they were like, Mrs. McAllister, how did you know? And I'm like, well, you know, I've lived the life of a young person and I've, and I still know, even as adults, we know what it's like to, um, to go through this. And um, it started a conversation that we continued for the rest of the year. And um, it's just, you know, it's just something that, that's what I really hoped for with this book was just to start a conversation of how to take ownership for when you've done something to hurt somebody um, and, and how do you make it right? Because, you know, relationships don't have to end just because you hurt somebody. Like you can, and, and I do this all the time. Like I, I try not to, you know, um, you know, have my pride. Like I hurt you and I do this with my kids. I've done this with my students. I hurt your feelings and I'm so sorry. And this is what I'm going to work on. So that's why I wrote my I'm sorry story. No, that's, that's good. And to hear all of that, I mean, I think it's so important for people to realize with anything, you know, like what, what is your purpose? Like, why did you write this? And whenever you see that there's this genuine like connection that each of you have to the stories that you've written because you've either lived a similar experience or, or you have some of your family that's been through it. And then you're just putting all that together and sharing a story with everybody else. I mean, there is so much power in that. And I've always said, and not that I've always believed this, but even if just one person reads the book and it's just the one person that needed it the most, I mean, they're going to tell others about it. It's going to change their life and it's going to impact other people. And so it's so important. And, and I mean, book sales are important, right? We want to sell our books, of course, but we all know very well, we're not going to become like can't quit our jobs, still have to keep working. We're not in it for like, yeah, super richness or anything for lack of a better word. <laughs> we want people to buy the books because we want them to see the stories. And I love holding the book in my hand. Like Kindle is great, but when you actually have, and all of your books are beautiful, the illustrations, the color, the things that are in the back. I mean, all of the things that are parts of those books, it's not just a story there's so much more to it. So knowing that connection that you have with the story that you're sharing and the why behind it is obviously so important. So thank you for telling about the story. And that will bring me to the next question, which is dramatic pause. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> kind of reverse it a little bit. So when writing, when sharing your story, and I mean, this could be for this, these books that we're talking about now, or the books that you may be working on, it's a challenge to kind of get through that whole process, wrap your head around, well, where am I going to begin? What am I going to put into it? How much, like, how long should this book be? And all of the parts that go into it. What do you think is or what what has been the biggest challenge for each of you when it comes to or came to writing your book and that again can go to anybody well i'll say for this book in particular i had um a vision of what i wanted the illustrations to look like and that was like you know i'm like i hope somebody understands i knew in my head what it felt like for a student to have a meltdown in school you don't feel like yourself and I always pictured it to be a shadow. So I wanted this kid to be look like a shadow amongst the classroom during the book and then somehow be able to have an opportunity to reverse that. And so um, I was, it was, I really wanted to connect with someone that was able to do that. And that took a lot of patience. So one thing I learned through this process is patience um, is definitely the key of to getting the, the, the outcome that you want for your book that you want for the audience, the one that feels good in your heart, not something that's just rushed, or let me hurry up and get it out there, you know. So for me, it was it was all about having patience. I think that's 
that's the key the key thing so that you know that illustrator and you are just the right fit and i think you'll know it once you connect with that illustrator and i think that's true for children's books you know it's different for other you know chapter books but for me um that was that was important thank you jeff or melody yeah um for, for me i I think the hardest part or the part that I perseverate the most on is the, um, kind of the editing. So for one drop of kindness, you know, um, a couple of people in my focus group thought that it was too long for a picture book, you know, um, not, not in length of pages, but in length of text. And um, so, you know, I try, you know, you go back and try to shorten, but you want to keep the, the story the same. And um, so for me, it's, you know, keeping it something that, can be listened to and shared with and related to by a lot of different people, but, you know, trying to make it as, as friendly to others as you can. And yeah, you know, maybe a four year old, when you're reading it to him, you have to stop and kind of do different things. But I, I think as educators or parents or adults, we can kind of, you know, revise and edit as we read along. You know, I do that with picture books all the time, as long as we're getting the, the meat of the message. So, you know, for me, it's just kind of making it, um, keeping that, the, the power of the actual message without losing it. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and I love what they both said, and I have to say that I feel the same exact way. Well, maybe not the exact way, because I'm not you, but um, I felt the same about like the, the just finding an illustrator to work with was extremely difficult. And then like, even the editing process, like I would, there are things about my story that I would love to edit right now. Like I would like to change it, you know? Um, but I think, I think the hardest part uh, too was, it, and believe me, going through a focus group is super hard, you know, just, you know, putting yourself out there is, is not, you know, even now I got like a four star review and I just, I can't read that review. And I'm like, why? I just, I want to know, but you know, I'm, I'm sure that I'll get a one star review someday, but it, you know, it's, it's fine. It's just a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of goes with the challenge of how will people um, accept my story? You know, um, my story is a lot like me. It's very simple. And um, I'm not, a, I'm not really into decorating. And so the illustrations for me, um, both my illustrator, we used to work together. So we have the vision of our actual students, you know? Um, and so that's why we chose it. And, um, and then like doing the font, I chose a font that was dyslexia, um, dyslexia friendly. I tried to put the elements that I live out in my life into my story. And just like both um, Dr. Joy and Jeff said, um, not everybody's gonna like it. It's not gonna be for everybody, but, um, and, and, but putting it out there anyway, knowing that there will be critical people, like that's probably something that I think every writer, I don't know, I feel like that was hard for me. I was really like nervous about putting it out there into the world. Yeah, That's absolutely. And even with the focus group, that was, you know, with the focus group, you get so much different feedback. And if mm -hmm. someone can say something and then the other person say the total opposite. So in the end, it's like you have to figure out what do you, how can you keep like the integrity of what you want in your book and then take what's really good. You know, you have to be willing to listen because mm -hmm. these people are reading your book and you're getting, you want to get the honest feedback. But mm -hmm. then you also have to think, okay, what? what do I need to change or shift because you can't put all the feedback into your book or you'll never get it done. <laughs> so. it's true. And it's, it's, true. it's hard to, um, it's hard to get a focus group. It's, it's hard to ask for people to be in your focus group because you know, especially now how busy everybody is and it's, yeah. and depending on the length of your books. <laughs> so if you're writing books, I mean, I got like 55,000 in my first one, I think. And, uh, and granted, I mean, I was able to share not just my story, but I had so many different educators. I had, I think, six guest chapters. And then I had probably 20 other people who contributed short vignettes. And that was important to me to not just, it's not just about me, it's about other people and their stories. And so being able to do that was kind of like my purpose and my mission. But giving that to people to read in the focus group and seeing what the feedback is. And sometimes it's just... I don't know, the grammatical errors or something. And then sometimes it's the, your writing and, you know, it's very confusing and like, what are you trying to say? And it, it's hard. You're vulnerable to that. And then Melody, back to your point about the Amazon reviews. And it's not just with those. I mean, it's any kind 
of feedback. I mean, conference presentations, uh, Amazon reviews, you name it, because it opens us up to criticism, whether it's, you know, I mean, it's meant to help us, but then as educators, I try to remind myself like, okay, we're giving our students feedback too, because that's how we help them to grow. And I've gotten some not so great reviews from conference presentations. And for a while, I stopped actually looking at them because it was bothering me so much, not because, and like I read them when I was reading them, taking what people were saying, but you know, with all the reviews that you get, sometimes there's just comments of things that are completely irrelevant in there and it's not actually helping you to grow. So you really have to learn how to kind of take it all in, but not let it make you question like what you wrote and the story you're telling, because that, I mean, I know that's kind of hard to get over a little bit, but I don't know, because you said too about changing the story and mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, but it, it'll, will it ever be perfect? I mean, it's perfect the way that it is, right? It's not ever yeah. going to be perfect. So you're going to, it's true. Yeah, you can, and you can always change it because trust me, I found errors even this year and I'm like, we need to fix those typos and how many people read it? How many times we've read it and fixed it? And um, that's okay because we're perfectly imperfect. <laughs> Yeah. Amen. Well, you know, that's part of, I think, the risk, too, is that, you know, we, you are, you know, everyone says, oh, it's, you know, no big deal. You wrote a book or writing a book is easy. It's like, no, it's really not, you know, and, you know, it's like 98% of the people want to write a book and 1.5% do. And you put yourself out there and you take the risk, you share your message, and not everyone's going to like it, and that's fine. Um, but then, yeah, so, you know, you get the one-star review. It has nothing to do with the book. <laughs> and then, you know, you hear different things and that's, you know, that's part of being educators. We have to have the feedback and I think it's really important and it also, you know, really grows your character and thickens your skin. But, um, you know, if I was to get feedback at, you know, Jeff, Hey, I love this, this, this. However, this could be, you know, that's great. Instead of like, you know, story sucks. Whereas that, you're not really telling me anything. And so I think that's why it's important to model that too with students. Like, you know, give details, really break it down and help someone grow or improve. So, yeah. I sure hope nobody's told you that your story sucks. That's <laughs> terrible, Jeff. And your story doesn't. So just putting that out there. Look yeah. You. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, it's just like, it's knowing how to give the feedback. And I mean, there's so many different analogies and things that people make. There's the sandwich that we've seen the images, you know, like <laughs> something good, something kind of to work mm -hmm. on. Um, I think it was Todd Whitaker, maybe, and Jeff Zoll, I think when they wrote the What Connected Educators Do Differently, I think it was in that book. I could be wrong. I'd have to go look at my notes. But it was talking about whenever you give feedback and you give people one to glow on, one to grow on, one to go on. I think is yeah. how it went. Maybe, maybe not necessarily in that order, but that's true. And if you took the time to read the book in this case and there's something about it you didn't like, then let us know, let the author know what it is. The same that we would for students, the same if we have critical friends and we say, okay, look, not everything's perfect. Like, it's awesome. It's great. You know, like, be real with me because I don't want to put something out there that is not the best that it can possibly, possibly be at this time. So uh, yeah. Can I say, is it okay if I interject something? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. I mean, that's why I love the edgy match family because I did get very critical feedback and my favorite feedback was from Kristen Nan. Um, she was part of my focus group and she gave me, um, her advice was amazing because, you know, I have only taught in Texas and public schools. And mm -hmm. so when I wrote my story, it was very much about how we ran our schools in Texas and she's on the East coast. And she said, you know, this doesn't really make sense for this age group where I'm from. We don't do things like this. And so I really struggled with, um, you know, she really struggled with understanding some of this. And I thought, well, crap. Well, I'm sorry if I'm not supposed to say that. Um, I, I'm just like, how am I going to change this? Like, this is I had already revised my story I could countless times, but I knew here's the thing is that I really trust Kristen Nan. I mean, she is, mm -hmm. she is somebody that supports me and cares about me. She wasn't just telling me stuff so that I feel badly about my story. She was trying to make it so that it was appealing to people all across the country. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, even though it was a little bit hard to hear um, because it meant that I had to go back and revise it. And I thought that I was done. Like, I knew that what she said was um, absolutely important and I needed to go back 
and revise again. And so um, I did, and I'm so glad she did that because once I revised it again, um, I gave it back to her and she was like, she loved it. You know, she's been a, she's been a huge support for me. And um, I feel like I have a better story because I listened to her advice and because I trusted her and knew that she wasn't telling me anything to make me feel bad. She was just wanted me to have a great story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you, Kristen. <laughs> when you ask people, it's important to um, align who, like the contents of your story with the people that you ask. So um, because the children, there were specific people and characteristics that I wanted for my focus group. You know, so I, and I, I really kind of detached from asking my friends because it's hard for me to say to my friend, like, I don't like it or this needs to be changed or even my professional friends, you know? So I really kind of detached and asked people based on what their role was and how they use children's books and, and things like that. And so I was really nervous because I knew I was going to get the honest truth from the people that I asked, but you know, so I think it's important to not to take the focus group process very seriously and that you're reaching out to people that are going to, you know, that really can um, can provide you with the feedback and that, you know, maybe have an interest in the topic that you're writing about or, you know, just um, that it matches. Yeah, I, I agree. And I know just for my books, I mean, I've had two of my books have been so far the ones published have been with EduMatch and I have two more <laughs> that will be coming out with EduMatch and I, I, oh. Have, oh, there you go. <laughs> I didn't, I should have intentionally not did that, but actually I was going to have that book be uh, unconventional, but intentional. We, I mean, that was like one of the first mm -hmm. to topics, titles that I thought about, but the next book that's going to be out, I think in November is when it will be. I just am finishing up the focus group with that now and it's, I'm getting the sketch notes and all of that. So it's exciting. It's a pretty thick book as well, mm -hmm. but it's about like that one kid and true story. And so this one, again, doesn't have individual chapters, but a lot of different vignettes about uh, and under a theme of thrive, which people will understand what thrive actually means in it, but just reading their stories too, like short stories or, and some of them were like 500 words, but all of the different stories I got for that book. And then the next one that's going to come out, that's about things I wish I knew or things I wish somebody knew just pulling all those stories in, like how it has helped me just to rethink so many things that I'm doing and not just professionally. I mean, all of these books are not specific to education. It's just specific to life. Uh, which yeah. is another thing yeah. that I noticed between all of your books is it's not like, oh, you can only use this in elementary school or if you're a teacher or in higher education. I mean, it's for anybody, kids, adults, education or not involved. Uh, and that's what I love most about them. So I don't know if that was intentional <laughs> for well, any of you. <laughs> Jeff, I don't want to interrupt what you were saying. Did you do I feel like you had something to say, but one thing I love about all of our books is that we have intentionally made it um, for all students. Like we, um, and something about edgy matches, we, we understand that there are populations that are marginalized and we believe in our core that when our students are holding our books or when children are holding our books or when families are reading together, we want them to feel welcome. And I absolutely love that about all of our books and about how we um, make our characters. And then every single one of our books on here, we have discussion questions and follow-up activities. And, um, and we didn't get together and talk about that. Um, when I first, so Jeff, Jeff's book was the first EduMatch children books that I had actually bought. And I had already submitted my story. Um, of course, it was going through the process, but when I saw that he had follow-up questions and activities, I was excited. Mm -hmm. It made me think, this is an educator. He knows I felt the same way, mm -hmm. of course, about mine. And then the same with Linnell's, I'm sorry, Dr. Joyce. <laughs> there are discussion questions at the very end and there are activities. And I think that's so great to help our families yeah. um, to keep taking the conversation and, and moving forward. We're very intentional. Um, and maybe this is unconventional, compared to some mainstream books, but, um, you know, we were very intentional about how we could reach our audience, you know, and our families. Yeah, and uh, one thing else I, I wanted to say, too, is just branching it out, I mean, on a global scale, too, we're going to put Jeff in on here, because I know that I've seen your book not titled One Drop of Kindness, a different mm. title. So I was curious yes, about I that. I thought I had it right here. Yeah. So 
Um, yeah, I, uh, I was blessed to have the book translated. And so Rochelle, being the fluent Spanish teacher, why don't you say it for us? So it's una gota de bondad, one drop of kindness. And it was, uh, um, you know, the illustration is the same. And the exciting thing for me is this, this opened doors for just a whole new, you know, generation and, and population. And I've already donated a bunch of books to Mexico. And I'm uh, working with a couple people down kind of in Calexico and, and some border towns. Um, to get the book there. And, you know, I think it's really important that especially for, you know, in California, we have a lot of dual immersion programs and um, not so much about the, you know, bilingual, but, you know, biliteracy. And the more we can get, you know, good books into the hands of many, many students. So that, you know, that was really exciting. And, um, you know, I, I, actually today it's Mexican Independence Day. And, um, so I'm glad we brought that up, but I, I think it's important for us to be able to, you know, reach across those um, invisible borders, however, however they are, and to reach different audiences. Yeah, and I, I would have read it for you, but I much prefer to have you read it because it's your, <laughs> it's your book, and, and I wanted to hear your Spanish as well. Although not yes. judging at all, but very no, that cool. is that is very exciting. And I did see that you were. Uh, having some books shared and sent. So that's awesome to see that your message is spreading and uh, the support that you're giving for that too. Okay, next question. And this may be our last question for today. This is a big one. <laughs> Not really. You're like, oh, what is it? I need, I've decided I need to, next week I'm going to have uh, Justin Schleider and Tatool on for my guests. And we're just going to talk about anything education. I think we're really going to have, we, we talked two years about doing a show where we just had a big wheel with topics and we would just spin it and whatever the topics were, that's what we would talk about. That's so I fun. think that's what we're going to do next week. But the big question here uh, for all of you is if you were to give advice to somebody who has been either thinking about writing a book or even a blog or has an experience that maybe they want to share, and maybe the writing is not necessarily the best format for it because I know we have podcasts that we do and we do different shows and, and all of these, I mean, different forms of media. What advice could you give to somebody who might be considering it, but kind of hesitant to get started? Can I answer that? Do you all mind? I get asked this no, a lot, actually. We don't mind. Okay. <laughs> I, I actually get asked this a lot. And so this is what I say to people. Um, if you are writing, just start writing. And um, I love that you said about the blog. I think a blog is a great way to experience critical feedback and to get um, a little bit, um, get your toes wet in that area and to get over the feeling of, I think the hardest part about writing is letting other people read your writing because you don't know how they're going to respond. And so to like make your way up to a book, start a blog. And of course it can be about whatever you want it to be. My, my blog is basically just what I'm learning about in life. And that talks about education, life, motherhood, whatever. Um, so definitely start with the blog and there are free blogs out there and, um, and, and that will help you to understand like that there are going to be people out there that are going to critically read what you're writing, but it's also going to help you understand that you can also empower people with your writing because there are people that are going to understand. I feel the same way they're going to say, and I'm so glad that you shared it. And um, that, that helps you to keep writing and it gives you that um, empowerment to keep on writing. So that's my advice. Yeah, one, one thing I want to add is that, you know, if the scribing or the written word is, is difficult, then you know, you know, video record yourself or flip grid yourself or audio record yourself. Tell your story or just talk how it is conversationally. And then you can always, you know, Google speak or transcribe it or however, but um, just, you know, start with a start with page or diary or journal, but keep putting it off and, you know, it won't get done. And then there's always the, I wish, I wish, I wish I could have, would have, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's a message share it and, you know, mm -hmm. share it with one of us. We'll read it and uh, give you some help. I mean, that's, that's what people are for. And I think it's important. Yeah, great advice. Thank Please, you. Like planes are flying by now. So I don't know if you can, <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. But um, I would say that it's important to like, they always say read, read, read then, right? 
And so I think that's a good idea. But then I think it's so much out there that if you focus on what everybody else is writing, if you'll keep change, you'll second guess yourself. So I think it's important to just um, come up with your own style, get it down, and and let it go, and then like go through a process of getting feedback instead of like, well, I read this and they had this and or they didn't, you know, because I went through that um, with my professional learning book, just trying to like say, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't do this or maybe. So just like get it, just get it down and then let it go and, you know, go through a process where you're able to get the good feedback, but um, you can't always look at what everybody else has mm -hmm. done or written and then try to compare what you're trying to do to that. Because if you're writing the message, there's somebody that needs it. So mm -hmm. that's my Agreed. Advice. Yeah. That was beautifully said. That's great said. advice, Dr. Joy. <laughs> and Jeff, great advice. And you know, so what I've started doing too is I'm going to give a shout out to um, my friend um, Dan Tricarco. He's an author with DBC Books and he, he writes on Zen and the Zen Teacher. And um, when I have a blog post that I really want critically to be viewed, like I give it to him because I know he's going to hit me with the truth. And so now that I've gone through the fire a little bit, I like it. I like more when people give me the really hard truth so that I can put a piece out there that's really strong instead of, um, you know, just like, oh yeah, it's good. I love it. So, I mean, find those people that are going to read critically over your writing. Um, once you get used to, um, I mean, that growth part is what make, makes me want to keep writing because I'm growing. And he's a high school English teacher. And he told me that my writing, just, he's like, your writing is improving. And I felt like, I don't care if I'm not in high school, that I'm almost 40 years old. That meant everything to me. So find your people. That. That's right. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great advice from everybody. And I laughed when Dr. Joy mentioned uh, the, oh, I forget how you said it now, but the story, don't try to write like somebody else's story. And I thought about my 18 year old self trying to write John Grisham and Mary Higgins Clark condensed novels of my own <laughs> because I thought I could. And I wrote about that in one of the books. I just, I was convinced, that, oh yeah, I can write a book like this, easy. And, and I couldn't clearly. And it took me a number of years until I started to write. But I did start because I was blogging. And then that kind of, in a way, turned into some parts of the book, just those ideas and things that I shared. So at any rate, uh, good chat today. Thank you all for joining in. And just one last kind of recap, where can we find you? Where can we find your books? I'll start with Melody. You can find every single one of our amazing books at edumatchpublishing.com. Okay. You'll find all of our books there and they are all on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. My bit.ly is bit.ly slash, and this is all lower caps. I'm sorry story. So if you want to find the, I'm sorry, bit.ly, I'm sorry story, bit.ly slash, I'm sorry story. Sounds good. Thank you, Jeff. Very cool. Um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or just go to jeffkubiak.com and they are there and you can get in touch with me there. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Easy enough. Thank you. And Dr. Joy. Uh, same thing, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, but you can always find me at joyworkedu something. So dot com at joyworkedu. Um, you know, at gmail.com. Everything is at joyworkedu. I'm not joyworks, no S, just joyworkedu. So that's my website. You can follow me on Twitter, my Facebook page. Um, so you can find me there. And thank you for having me again, Rochelle. All right. Absolutely. Thank you all. And for everybody that's joined us or anybody that's watching later, we hope you enjoyed this and will join us next week and upcoming episodes. So have a great rest of your day.